you, Lou. Thank you for inviting me uh, to deliver this talk. Uh, I'm going to share my screen first and foremost. So if you'd bear with me a minute whilst I... My screen. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect. Sorry, it's a bit confusing when you start sharing your screen. If you're not using double screens, then you can't see people. So there we go. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ilaha and I work as the youth tech lead for a charity called Refuge. Some of you may have heard of Refuge before. Uh, we run the domestic violence, gender based violence support services in Lewisham Borough and Goldsmith comes under Lewisham. Uh, so I work for a specialist service called the Tech Abuse Service, which I'll talk about in a bit. But the first question that might come into your mind, the question that may have come into your mind when you signed up for this talk is to why, why am I using the term tech abuse? What is tech abuse? So tech abuse is gender-based violence that is perpetrated through or aided by the use of technology. It maps on the varying ways of domestic violence is perpetrated. Uh, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll explain in a bit as to how technology could be used to facilitate and aid gender-based violence. So the misuse of technology could facilitate uh, different forms of gender-based violence that we're familiar with, for example, physical abuse, uh, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, uh, psychological abuse, and uh, economic abuse, as well as stalking and harassment. Let's look at some examples in which technology could be used to facilitate uh, physical abuse. Uh, in our line of work, we see quite a lot with destruction and removal of uh, property by the use of technology, monitoring uh, uh, tech use. So we see cases where, um, you know, internet of things is used, for example, smart home devices are used where perpetrators would, you know, monitor conversations, or they would use uh, smart heating devices to be able to further their physical abuse. Location tracking is a big, big one that we're seeing and location tracking could take different forms. It could be, uh, you know, uh, it could happen uh, through compromised email accounts, uh, shared location services, family sharing, uh, but often it could take the form of stalkerware and spyware, which I'll talk about in detail in a second. We see quite a lot with recording devices. Perpetrators would, you know, um, put recording devices and properties and through recording devices, then they would be able to locate locations of survivors who have potentially fled their abuses. Uh, in cases of modern slavery and trafficking, we see, uh, we've seen um, cases of microchipping. Uh, with sexual abuse, uh, we see cases of uh, sharing of intimate images, uh, which some people also call the so-called revenge porn, but the sector, the domestic violence sector, the gender-based violence sector sort of moved away from using the term revenge porn because at the end of the day, it's not porn. When we say revenge porn, it legitimizes the abuse, but it is not porn, it is abuse. We also say, uh, see threats to share intimate images. And whilst often images might not be shared, the threat in itself could be quite damaging for survivors. Online grooming, uh, creating, you know, uh, fake, fake images and then uh, threatening to share them or sharing them further. We also call them deep fakes. And then recording without consent, you know, recording um, a survivor without their consent is what we quite often see in cases of sexual violence. With psychological abuse, obviously we see quite a lot with gaslighting, online impersonation. We've seen a lot of cases where perpetrators have created fake accounts uh, and then send persistent abusive messages via social media, stalking and harassment, uh, 
constant calls and text messages, persistent calls and text messages is also another form of psychological abuse where technology is misused. And uh, the misuse of internet of things, like I mentioned earlier, we've had cases where perpetrators have, um, you know, misused smart home technologies to listen in to survivors and then somehow insinuating that probably the survivor could be going crazy. So it could come under gaslighting and misuse of um, internet of things both. Uh, in terms of economic abuse, uh, we've seen a lot of cases where perpetrators have taken debt in clients' name. It's a form of digital fraud. Uh, we've seen cases of controlling resources, um, you know, enforcing spending limits on accounts. And it's very much possible to be able to do that without, you know, uh, even if they don't have access to the account, because technology has made it so easy for perpetrators to be able to further their abuse. So, so we've seen a lot of cases where debt has been taken uh, into survivor's name without their knowledge, or they have used, they've put caps onto their account, so their spending limits could be controlled. And obviously online banking is, as a lot of us are moving towards online banking, towards a cashless society, we see quite a lot, um, quite a lot of cases where technology is being used to perpetrate economic abuse. So how how it all began? Why did we think that there was there was a need for for a specialist tech abuse service? Um, as you can see, some some headlines that I've put here, some headlines in news articles that shows how tech abuse is emerging. I would like to invite you to take a minute or two to read some of these. So on any given day, Refuge is an organization supports 6,500 uh, women and children. Uh, we also work with, with male survivors um, as well, but a lot of our refuge accommodation based services are for women and children specifically. So what we were seeing was that often we would see survivors who would move into our refuge services, so safe accommodation services, and then somehow they would be located in that safe services. And the question that we were asking ourselves was, why, why is it happening? We have done everything. We've safety planned, you know, we've ensured that uh, all the devices are safe and secure. Then what, what, what is really going on here? How are these survivors being located? And when a survivor gets, gets located in a safe accommodation, which we called refuge, um, it not only puts that survivor at risk, but also other survivors who are in that refuge and also staff members at risk. So we needed to do a bit more. We needed to be a step ahead of the perpetrators and we needed to know what kind of technologies these perpetrators are using to be able to locate these survivors and then further and facilitate their abuse. And that's why we decided to launch a specialist a tech abuse service. So in February uh, 2018, we were quite lucky that we were able to secure some funding from Google, the tampon tax and comic relief. And we started um, our service of six tech abuse leads and a manager. So I'm one of those tech abuse leads. I specifically work with young people, but within my team, we've got people who specialize in economic abuse. We've got people who specialize in working specifically with the BAMA community. We've got people who specialize in working with the LGBTQ plus community. We've got people who specialize in working with people with disabilities. So we are a very diverse team, a very diverse and intersectional team. Um, and we also have, a, have a, a, a team manager. So we are a team of seven people. But alongside the seven of us, we've also recruited 105 tech champions. So these are our fr frontline workers um, who work internationally and provide frontline support to survivors of domestic and sexual violence. And they have been trained. They've received additional training from us on uh, identifying the signs of technology facilitated abuse uh, and they are basically the local experts within their own services and they provide you know uh, tech uh, tech abuse uh, risk assessment and safety planning locally the team uh, our team aims to cascade the specialist learning uh, to staff and the local local agency so we also work very closely with local services uh, in the boroughs that we work with. So I, I work specifically in Lucian area, but from time to time nationally as well. So the aim is to be able to pass on the information to local agencies and people like yourself. So you know how tech could be misused to further and facilitate gender-based violence. And we work very closely with, with our frontline workers who are caseworkers, independent domestic violence advisors, independent sexual violence advisors. Uh, so they, 
so they're able to provide uh, provide you know appropriate support to survivors who've experienced tech facilitated abuse. What are our key messages? So one of our main messages is to be one step ahead of the changes in technology as it's, it's constantly evolving. You're all young people, uni students, you probably know that how technology could be used to you know, facilitate different forms of abuse. We as a team, we like to keep one step ahead of this abuse. So we do a lot of research. We constantly want to be in the know um, about the up and coming tech developments. Uh, so, um, and then, to be able to pass on this information to, to other agencies and other professionals is one of our, our aims. Empower survivors to use technology safely. And this is very, very important. We understand that depriving survivors of their technology is never a solution. And we've often seen when we've worked with other local agencies, police, for example, social services, the message often has been to get the, their technology away of survivors the message has always been so why don't you just give up your facebook account and if your perpetrator is using facebook to abuse you if you're receiving persistent messages or there is talking and harassment happening maybe you should just give up your social media accounts and that's never ever the message because a survivor could be using their technology to connect, to build a community. They could be using their technology if they live in a different, if their family live in a different country to connect with their family and friends. Uh, so taking their technology away from them could uh, compound their isolation even further. So it's very, very important that we're not telling survivors to give up on their technology ju just because tech is being used to abuse them. The key message is to empower them to be able to use their tech in a safe and positive way promote a learning culture and uh, that's that's absolutely important that is part of the reason why we're doing this talk um, the other important factor is avoid educating perpetrators now we know that there is a lot of advanced technology that could be used to to you know um, further uh, gender-based violence but we're very careful when we do training sessions or we do a lot of work with the media for example last year we did a program with Victoria Derbyshire and we were talking about the support that we provide and some of some provided some case studies some of our clients um, interviewed on the show but we were very careful that we're not giving a lot because then this the this knowledge could be used and misused by perpetrators to further their abuse we also lobby government and industry leads, and that's very important. Uh, we were involved in, in consultation for the online harm white paper. Can I ask if anyone has heard about the online harm white paper at all? So this is going to be a piece of legislation that hopefully if the bill passes, that would come into force uh, hopefully in the next few years. Um, what that would mean is that the government would put more responsibility on tech companies uh, and there would be an allocated lead with every uh, tech company that would work really closely with the government and Ofcom to make sure that you know they're taking responsibility and they're uh, monitoring their platforms closely. So we're, we, were, we, were, we were quite closely involved with the consultation with that. And hopefully if, it, if, if, if this if the bill does pass, then it would it would it would really benefit our client group and I think any anyone in general really. Uh, we were also recently involved in the consultation on the Communication Act uh, and the Malicious Communication Act. Um, we also work very, very closely with big tech giants like Facebook. So we are trusted partners with Facebook. What that means is that from time to time, if, if Facebook uh, or um, you know Instagram or uh, WhatsApp is being used to, to abuse a survivor, then we can directly uh, contact them and escalate that form of abuse. We've seen... Uh, we, we've utilized that trusted partner uh, partnership quite a lot and we've, we've been able to take down accounts on Facebook, take take down um, sexually explicit images um, in the past. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a good platform that we, we've built with Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp. We are also trusted partners with YouTube uh, and Twitter and most recently TikTok. So I just want to do a little activity before I move on. And um, if I can just ask all of you, some of you may have done that already. For those of you who haven't, I think this is probably your chance to do it. If you can take your phone out or if, if you're on a computer, you can use your computer as well and Google your full name, your first name and your last name and um, tell us what you find if you're if you're comfortable uh, in sharing that. Because uh, sometimes when I do this activity with uh, 
with young people or survivors and I ask them to Google themselves, they find things that they didn't know existed. And I always advise people to Google themselves from time to time. So if you can maybe do that, take, take a minute or two to do that. And uh, if you want to share any of your findings with us, feel free to pop it in the chat feature. Okay, so I've got some, Joe said, all my social media accounts and old photos on Google images that I didn't know were there. My LinkedIn, Facebook, an empty Pinterest account of mine, yes. Yeah, that's a good point, Joe. All just social media I have, Maya. Thank you for sharing that. A really old a newspaper article from when I was in secondary school, Lou. Thanks for sharing that. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Lou, um, Maya, Bromla, and Joe for sharing that. Um, so now I want you to maybe question yourself what the implication of this could be on a survivor, uh, someone who has fled from an abuser. And if, uh, let's say, for example, a survivor who's fled from an abuser and they've moved into a safe accommodation, a refuge, um, and they obviously, if they, if, they, if they do get found by the perpetrator that they fled from, then, you know, they could be at risk of physical abuse, uh, even homicide in some cases. So what could the implication of this information being online without that knowledge that they didn't know any of this information existed could be on, on a survivor? Maybe just some thoughts, if, if you can share some thoughts in the, in the chats. Quite high up there is a review I posted. It's the beautician, it gives my location. Yes, thank you, Romla, yeah. I hope I'm saying your name right. Feel free to correct me if I'm not. Yes, that's that's very that's that's absolutely the key location. Sometimes the things that are up there about you online could give away your location. And for a survivor who's fled an abuser, that could be you know that that is you know um, that could be very damaging. That could be harming. That could put them at risk of serious serious harm. I also would like you guys to do something else. Um, if you if you haven't if you haven't already uh, seen this whilst you Google yourself, maybe go on a website called 192.com and on 192.com type in your first name and your last name and see what you find. Loads of Lewis said loads of relevant tags on images on image search has all my old work, school name, other organization I've been involved with or related to location and hometown. Yes, absolutely, Lou. And for a survivor, that potentially means that their location could be compromised. If, if it's a new location they've currently moved to, even if it's an old location that an abuser that is probably stalking them or harassing them by having this information, they, they, would, be able to, um, they would be able to know where they potentially live and it would be very easy for them to then track them further. 192.com, Maya, I've put in the chat as well. So yeah, if you can do that and take a minute or two and then share some of your findings with me, if you're comfortable, that is. Mine came up with no results. That's that's great news from that. Sometimes when you type your name, mine came up with request blocked. That's also fairly positive. Uh, so 192.com is a website where um, if you have if you if you've registered to vote, um, and you haven't put yourself on the anonymous register, anonymous electoral register, then it means that your address, uh, your address at the time that you signed up to vote is for public consumption, it means that it's public property. So at any point, um, 
people could actually look your name up on 192.com. Not your, your full address doesn't show up. Only only the the first the beginning of your address shows up. But people could essentially, if you if, if people get a paid membership paid membership of 192.com, then they could essentially sort of get the full information. And this is it's very very important to remember so the, the work that we do with survivors we always always tell them when you're registering to vote you need to make sure that you put yourself on the anonymous register and for those of you um yes my address but with my postcode um yeah um I didn't know that that's scary yeah so essentially if, if if you search yourself and if your address even half of it came up people would be able to obtain the full address if they were to pay a certain amount of money, but it's possible to remove that. So the first thing you need to do is if you're not on the anonymous register, now this is not relevant to, to everyone. Some of you might be fine with your address being on 192.com or your address not being on the anonymous register, but for survivors, that could be life-threatening. If their address is eventually on, you know, the, the public register, then that could be that could have life threatening implications for them. So we, we always tell survivors to make sure that their address is on they are on the anonymous register. Uh, and if if anything on 192.com show up, then they can they can call their council or the council at the time when they're registering uh, and request that they put them on the anonymous register. Um, so Maya, the reason why it happened was because when you register to vote, uh, you you didn't opt in for the anonymous register so you 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 that that essentially means that's where 192.com obtain all the data from it's the electoral through the electoral register and and that's what they tell you when you sign up a lot of the times we don't read term and conditions we just go and tick everything and it's important to read those things so you can actually call your council and ask them to put you on the anonymous register but also on 192.com there is a form that you can complete called the co1 form uh, and request them to remove your data. It's the CEO on record removal form that you can complete from their website um, and ask them to remove uh, that information. They would do that. But do contact your council as well and ask them to put you on the anonymous register. And for those of you who haven't registered to vote, it's something to keep in mind. Uh, when you're signing up, just make sure that you, you opt, opt out of the public register and opt in for the anonymous register. Any questions or any thoughts so far? So this was just sort of to give you an, a very brief idea. And this is just the very basic thing um, that perpetrators could potentially exploit. This is like the technology that perpetrators could exploit to further and facilitate their abuse, to be able to track a survivor online. But there is other more high-tech forms of tech abuse out there as well. I'll talk briefly about them um, in a second, but this is to give you an overview of that, you know, it's, it's, it's not very difficult to be able to do these things. Um, that's why our service exists. Uh, and that's why we're here to support survivors to be able to navigate uh, technology safely and positively without having to give up their technology. Okay, so moving on. Um, I want to talk about tracking and surveillance, which is, you know, um, very common in the forms of cases that we see. We see a lot of cases of, you know, survivors being tracked um, and surveilling devices being used uh, by perpetrators. There are six ways in which this form of abuse could be facilitated. Number one is location settings. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. For those of you who use iPhones, for example, there are features like find my friends or, you know, find my iPhone if that feature is switched on essentially. And if you're sharing your location with someone else, uh, then they essentially know where you are. Snapchat is another example of location settings. If you haven't switched on the ghost mode, um, and you forgot to do it at any point or you've recently switched it on or someone else has gone through your phone and switched it on, then that means if you have fled, then the perpetrator has got access to your location. Um, so it's important to keep in mind to check location settings occasionally and just making sure that if you are, if you have got your location settings on that you're only sharing it with people that you actually trust. Um, and just going through the settings every, every once in a while, just 
checking what you have got switched on, what, what you don't have switched on. Um, and is it important to, to allow your location permission to certain, certain third party apps, for example? Um, so I, from time to time, would just go, if, I, if I've downloaded a new, a new application on my phone, uh, sometimes they automatically access my location. And then from time to time, I would just go check all my location permission and see that a third party application that I've downloaded recently is actually using my location without my knowledge. Uh, and then I would go and switch it off. Now, for a survivor, the repercussions of that could be absolutely huge because this setting could be used to track them in their safe location. Um, and, and the harm around that could be absolutely huge as well. Uh, linked devices. So that's that's another big one that we've seen quite a lot with perpetrators exploiting this feature, this technology to be able to track survivors. By linked to devices, I mean, uh, if someone else has set up your account and somehow their device is linked to yours uh, with iPhones, for example, if your Apple ID is connected to um, another account, an iPad or a MacBook, then if you have left uh, with that iPhone where your Apple ID is still logged into a MacBook or an iPad, then through the iPad, uh, that individual might be able to, to track your location. And that it, it, not just location, at times it, it, it gives them access to your iMessages, it gives them access to, you know, your purchase history, uh, quite a lot really. So it's, it's, it's also something worth keeping in mind from time to time checking for any devices that could be linked to your account. Um, because the repercussions of that could be absolutely massive. Um, access to accounts, we see quite a lot with perpetrators having set up accounts for survivors. And a lot of it comes down to power and control because we know that gender-based violence, domestic violence is all about power and control and it creates a power dynamic. A lot of the survivors that we work with, their technologies, you know, not, not huge, but the perpetrators on the other hand, they tend to be quite tech savvy. We've worked with survivors who's, you know, Whose abuser work as um, in cybersecurity, for example, they're software engineers. So clearly, like they have, before the relationship ends, they have access to all the accounts, and they they set up they've set up all their accounts for them. They've set up all the devices for them. What that essentially means that when they fled, the access still remains. Uh, the, through those accounts that they've set up, now they'd be able to access quite a lot. Not just be able to read the emails that a survivor is sending, but be able to access their locations, essentially, any messages that they have sent, their web search history, for example. So access to the account is another big one that we're seeing in our casework. Tracking applications. Um, so these bear in mind, the tracking apps are very different to spyware and stalkerware. Uh, tracking apps are just third party applications that you can people could download. Um, and they kind of work like GPS. GPS trackers uh, and even if some, uh, the inbuilt location services are off on a device tracking applications could potentially give access to locations. Um, the fifth one is spyware and stalkerware. Can I ask if anyone has ever heard of that term? So a spyware is a malicious software uh, that you know um, that could could be sent to your to your device. Um, you know, it could be in different forms. Um, people who 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 work tech savvy, they might be familiar with it. And um, a lot of a lot of you know hackers use things like spyware and malware to be able to spy on on celebrities or spy on people and then sextort, take money out of them and blackmail them. But in this case, in in in, um, in the context of gender based violence, we see perpetrators. Uh, abuses intimate intimate ex-partners or intimate partners use this kind of technology to further and facilitate their control. So we've seen loads and loads of cases of a spyware being used. People don't need physical access to be able to send a spyware to someone's, um, you know, someone's device, someone's computer or phone. Um, it is it is possible to do that remotely as well. And that's why we always tell people not to open any unidentified links that you may have received, the text messages that you receive from time to time, or, you know, the junk mails that you receive asking you that your um, you know, asking you to open a link or telling you that pay your PayPal account has been hacked or your LinkedIn account has been hacked. If you don't, if you don't click on this link, that your account would be removed. So all those kind of scam emails that come there, essentially, you know, they're all all phishing phishing attempts, and they could potentially be after after your data. Uh, so big hackers, and you know, 
um, scamming gangs use use those but we've seen a lot of cases of intimate partners using this kind of technology as well and last but not the least is physical trackers so these are actual physical trackers that um, uh, you can purchase people can purchase them um they're very readily available things like you know um um the vodafone little tracker which is you know sort of like quite readily available nowadays in the market and you know all these these um big retail companies are, cr are creating these these tracking uh devices and they're saying that it's to keep you and your children safe and then there's argument against that because they could so easily be exploited by perpetrators um so we've seen things like trackers being used in cars um you know trackers being placed and bags, handbags, uh, and children toys. Um, you know, some of them could be peer recording devices. Some of them could be actually GPS trackers. Uh, Lou has asked the question, do they get access to your messages through spyware or all activity? I've seen it in the movies. Oh, I don't know uh, what spyware actually does. Yes, there's different versions available um, in the market without giving too much information. Um, some of them, some very strong ones that people could actually pay for and purchase a package. They give access to everything. They essentially clone your phone. And then, so they would be able to see everything that you get up to on your phone. Even when you're typing passwords, they could be able to see. So all activity messages, locations, emails, anything that you do on your phone, any data that is on your phone, potentially uh, through the use of a very strong spyware, uh, perpetrators could access that. Yeah, I know this kind of technology exists in the movie and you might think that, okay, this, 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 is, this is a bit too extreme and it only happens to celebrity or very high profile people, but perpetrators, abusers are using these technologies on, you know, survivors, on people like day-to-day -day people. So this is, this is very much happening to, to our clients um, on, on a very regular basis, unfortunately. And that's why we call for, you know, better legislation and the online harms white paper, if, if that passes through, then it would just place a lot more responsibility on, you know, developers and tech companies. And I think a certain degree of responsibility lies on the government as well, because we need better legislations around, around the production of, of, of these kind of applications and, and these kind of software. Um, just to let you know, um, as of a month ago, Google has banned all stalkerware, so all tracking application and stalkerware from uh, from Google Play Store. So that was a step in the right direction. We were very thrilled when they announced that that they would not be uh, they would not be allowing any sort of applications that have any sort of stalking ability uh, built in. Uh, so that was a step in the right direction. We're really hoping that in the future with better legislation and better monitoring of tech companies that this kind of abuse would be a story of the past. So um, I really want to talk about, um, without going into too much detail, because this is a big conversation and probably require, a, I can talk about it for, for a whole day and for hours and hours um, about Im image-based sexual abuse, because um, as Joe and Lou mentioned, you guys work around, around sexual violence. And, um, and so I want to talk about how tech could be used to facilitate a sexual violence. And the most prominent form um, is image-based sexual abuse or the term uh, revenge porn that some people use, which I mentioned earlier, that we're moving away from that terminology because uh, we are hoping that even with like legislation as well, they would in the future completely ban <laughs> using that term because I absolutely despise it if I'm honest. Uh, so image-based sexual abuse could take the form of sharing of intimate images online without someone consent. It could take the form of, you know, uh, recording images or downloading images without consent. And it kind of goes very much hand in hand with the use of spyware. So we've seen cases where perpetrators have used spyware. Um, they've sent, you know, um, they have somehow sent spyware to a device or they have had physical access to a device and they've put installed a spyware on, on a phone or a computer. And through that spyware, then they were able to obtain sexual images, intimate images. Um, of a device and they then make threats to share them online and in, in some cases they have actually shared those images online so we call that image-based uh, sexual abuse um, now image-based sexual abuse is is a criminal offense uh, in england and wales 
um, and um, you know the rest of the UK, it is a criminal offence to share someone's images online without their consent, and it could be reported to the police. The police has to, have to take appropriate action to be able to remove those images online and then get the right support for a survivor. Unfortunately, what's not a crime in England and Wales, whilst it is a crime in Scotland, is the threats to share intimate images. So if someone makes a threat to share intimate images online, that is not a criminal offence. Uh, we've seen cases where survivors have been threatened that their intimate images would be or videos would be shared online. Uh, and they have reported it to the police and then the police have sort of just turned around and said, um, but come back to us when it's shared. At this point, we can't do anything about it because it is actually not a criminal offence in England and Wales. So in order to address that, um, we're currently as an organization, we're lobbying the government to criminalize the threats to share. Uh, so through frontline work, the work that our team was doing, we actually noticed that there is this big gap in the law and we needed to do something about it. So we got together with our policy team and we launched a campaign called the Naked Threat Campaign. If you want to read more about it, I would highly encourage to check our website. We've launched a whole report because we produced a survey and we surveyed quite a few um, young people um, around, you know, if they've ever been threat, uh, threatened to share, um, for their intimate images to be shared online. Uh, so there's, there is a lot of finding from, from the survey, um, which, which due to time limitation, I can't share all of it with you. So I would encourage if you have time, go on our website, refuge.org.uk. You can read the full report um, and the results from the survey that we launched. And if you have a minute, you can also write to your local MP uh, about this campaign and ask them to criminalize threats to share intimate images because it would it would make a huge huge difference to survivors if this was to be criminalized there is when threats are made there is ways around that we would always advocate for um, you know for survivors on their behalf to make sure that they have the right support in place and if they have reported to the police that law enforcement support them with sort of ways around we look at things like blackmail, for example, malicious communication. I'll talk about tech and the law in a second, uh, but that it should be a crime on its own. And, and it is a big gap. So if you have if you have a moment, then please do have a look at this campaign and write to your M MP um, as well. It would, it would make a huge, huge difference in, in lives of survivors uh, that we work with. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, I'm moving on. So what are some of the signs of tech abuse? If any of uh, this kind of abuse is happening to you or you know, a, a friend or anyone that you happen to know or a survivor, what should they look out for? And we, we mentioned um, about stalkerware and spyware. Um, and it's difficult to tell if there is a spyware on someone's device because it disguises itself. Uh, it hides behind different apps and it's difficult to be able to track it. Uh, but there are some signs that you can essentially look out for um, to know if, if, if uh, this kind of abuse uh, could be happening um, or your device could be compromised in any way, shape or form. The first one is um, obviously someone knowing something they shouldn't. So if people know um, information that you've sent via text messages, to a friend or a family member, but there is no way of them knowing other than them having physical access to your phone, to your text messages or listening into your conversations, then this is obviously a sign that there could be something more malicious going on. Maybe, maybe they're using technology, maybe they're misusing technology to get the information. The other sign, and this is a big one for spyware and stalkerware on a device as well, is the phone glitching, overheating, and excessive ba battery dra drainage. And I know that uh, a lot of the new phones, my iPhone, for example, it drains every, after three hours, the ba battery would be completely drained. Um, so I'm talking about excessive battery drainage. If there is a spyware on a device, uh, it means that the battery usually runs out within 30 minutes or an hour. If that that is happening that then I would be just looking at something sort of a bit more malicious. Um, also overheating, 
um, and data running out quickly as well. So data and battery running out quicker than before is a big sign of spyware um, on, on a device. Because bear in mind that it's running at the background without your knowledge and it's getting all the data. It needs internet to be able to function. It needs data and it needs battery to be able to function. So it drains a lot of battery. And sometimes the phone could get overheated and there could be glitching on the phone. If you're on the phone with someone, and you're just hearing noises in the background or there's like glitching on the phone, then this is a big sign of something more malicious happening on the phone. Messages or email have been opened. So messages are read without you having read them or emails being read without you having read, oh, so apologies. And then being told you're being monitored. And uh, yeah, that happens actually quite a lot. Some, some of the survivors that we work with, their perpetrators tend to be, you know, take a lot of pride in being tech savvy so they would actually disclose that information and say you know what I, I know I know what you're doing you can't you can't get away from me no matter where you go I'll find you so that could be you know an indication for us that maybe maybe he would he intends to use technology in the future or he could be using technology or and then any previous history of tech misuse so stalking um via technology, harassment via technology in the past could be an indication that it could, it could essentially happen in the future as well. Things like, you know, asking for passwords, sharing password, that's not normal behavior. Yeah, that is controlling behavior. Um, asking uh, to see text messages, Facebook messages, having access to a partner's social media account, that is not very healthy behavior. So that could, that essentially is an indication of, of uh, tech use. Does anyone have any any questions at all so far? So I want to move into uh, tech and the law. Obviously, we talked about use of spyware, tracking devices, um, you know, image based sexual abuse. Um, and when we do this talk or when we deliver training around tech abuse, one of the main questions that always, always pop is, um, is this, is this legal? How could this be happening? How could people be exploiting technology to just to this extent? What is, what could, what is the repercussions of that? So what does the law say? Um, as much as there is a gap in the law, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that the threats to share intimate images is not um, an offense and there is some other gaps in the law, which I'm hoping in the next few years would be addressed. There is actually some legislation that criminalizes a tech facilitated abuse. So first and foremost is the section 33 of the Criminal Justice and Courts Act. Uh, this is disclosing private and sexual images and photos with the intent to cause distress. Now this is also has some people call the Revenge Porn Act. Uh, um, so it is a criminal offense to share someone's images without their consent. And if it is reported to the police and they don't do anything about it, they must. The law says that you have to take action. Um, the section 127 of the Malicious Communication Act of 2003. So what that means is if, if um, persistent text messages, abusive text messages or messages via social media under the Communication Act of 2003 is a criminal offense. It also goes very much hand in hand with the Malicious Communication Act of 1988, the section one of the Malicious Communication Act. So if someone is sending abusive messages, making threats and, you know, or anything that is abusive, that is a criminal offence under the law. The Computer Misuse Act of 1919, this is something that always surprised me because this, this uh, act is so old and technology is constantly evolving. So this act really needs to change and, and, and evolve a little bit. There needs to be some amendment to this. But it is a criminal offence. Uh, so if a spyware is found on someone's device by the police after they've performed a sweep, um, then you know they can they can they need to take action around that because under the computer misuse act it is a criminal offense also things like surveillance so using you know iot alexas um, smart home devices or you know cctvs uh, using cameras to spy on someone all of that comes under the computer misuse act of 1990 and then there's the Data Protection Act of 1998, to sh sharing private information about people online without their, their consent. Something that we also call doxing. I don't know if anyone has heard of this term. It's sharing information about people um, online 
So it is a criminal offence under, under the Data Protection Act. We also have the Fraud Act of 2006. Uh, so this is if someone has taken credit cards um, in someone's name without consent, uh, applied for overdrafts, um, all of that uh, comes under the Fraud Act. Protection from Harassment Act, um, and that goes hand in hand with the threats to kill offences against a person. Uh, so if threats to harm or kill are made, uh, if threats to harm are made, it will come under the Protection from Harassment Act, which also has the um, amendment of the stalking. So stalking also comes under the harassment, Protection from Harassment Act. Um, so if threats to harm are made, then we would always argue that it's not malicious communication, instead it's harassment, just because with harassment, there is ways around it. People could apply for a harassment protection order. They could, you know, there is, uh, there's just different remedies if it comes under the Protection from Harassment Act rather than the Malicious Communication Act. But the sentence for malicious communication is up to six months. They're hoping, I think, with the new consultation that we did with the uh, or with the law, um, uh, uh, we recently, recently recently were part of a. Um, apologies, we were recently part. I'm just reading the question as well uh, from Valve. The GDPR Data Protection Act is renewed in 2000. And, uh, uh, yes, that's right. It, it's actually so. Um, the Pro Data Protection Act is a bit different from the GDPR uh, Act. Um, so that because the GDPR is under the EU law. The Data Protection Act is is a different one, but you're right. There is GDPR as well, which I will talk about in a second, because there it covers quite a few different things. Um, so where was I? I was talking about uh, protection from harassment ha act. That we would always argue uh, if a th threats to harm are made, that it's um, it's actually harassment rather than malicious communication, because with malicious communication. Um, the sentence is only six months. They were, they're hoping to amend it to two years uh, and making the sentence a bit stricter. There is usually a penalty and a six month sentence at this point, but with, with harassment, there's also six month sentence up to, it could, it could be extended up to nine months, but people, survivors could actually apply for, um, for, um, for an injunction called the protection from uh, harassment injunction and that that's that's that could be quite good because the breach of that could be a criminal offense um on its own so we, we always with survivors that we work we always argue if any threats are made that it's it's seen as harassment rather than malicious communication and then the threats to kill uh offenses against the person act so if a threat if someone threatened to kill someone um, online send messages threats to kill that is a criminal offense and then there's the blackmail um, a blackmail offense uh, blackmail is a criminal offense under the theft act of 1968 so as i mentioned earlier the threats to share intimate images of someone online is not a criminal offense but we can always argue if they're asking if, if the perpetrator is asking for something in return uh, then we can always argue that they are they're committing an offence by blackmailing their survivors. We can also argue that it's malicious communication or harassment. Um, and then last but not the least, the coercive and controlling behaviour, which was criminalised in 2015. So things like, you know, um, controlling social media accounts, economic abuse, and uh, quite a few other things come under coercive and controlling behaviour. And, it, it, uh, and since 2015, it's a criminal offence. Any any questions about um, about the legislation? I'm just I'm going to read some of the thoughts from. Um, so it is clear a lot of the this misuse can be quite extreme, but also thinking about ways we might use this day to day that we don't recognize as harmful, i.e., showing friends the nude someone sent only to you or checking someone's Snapchat locations yes absolutely um Rom romla has asked do you think tech abuse has been appropriately considered in current domestic violence bill uh, in the parliament this year i have heard there are important omissions yes absolutely we were because as an organization we work we have the specialist service and we were we we were consulted with the domestic violence bill so yes um the Threats to share intimate images would be part of, we are hoping that it will be part of the domestic abuse bill. That's what we are campaigning for. 
um, and also image-based sexual abuse for, for, for there to be better legislation around um, image-based sexual abuse. Um, what's the main pushback you get for legal change? Um, well, I can't really answer that. That's probably just a question based suited for our policy team. But I think one of the main things that I've heard from our policy team is that um, um, that there is other law around it. They say, oh, but we have the Malicious Communication Act, for example, we have blackmail and then maybe, maybe, maybe could go on coercive and controlling behavior. But if there is not an actual legislation, then it's difficult for us when we go to the police and advocate on survivor's behalf for us to, to get a positive response. And I think threats to share images online, it's it's a criminal offense in Scotland, for God's sake, and we're it's just down the road from us. It's a criminal offense in Canada and Australia and a lot of other countries. So why can't we criminalize it? Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the main things that we hear quite a lot that there is, but there is other legislation. Why don't you just argue that? Unless there are firm legislation, it's difficult to get an outcome from law enforcement. It's like coercive and controlling behavior before it was criminalized in 2015. And I've been working in this sector since 2015. Um, so before, before it was firmed up and all police forces were, even, even when, when you know, um, it came into force, um, some police forces were still not being trained on it. So we were still sort of getting, you know, not very positive responses. But now since, since we have a law that controlling behavior, and it, it, it was very clear that, you know, even controlling your social media accounts, it is co coercive and controlling behavior and it's, it is a criminal offense. So now they know better. If we have like very firmed up laws that were very clearly written and very clearly define this kind of abuse, then it just makes our life as, as advocates uh, a lot easier, but also it benefits survivors quite a lot who want to go down that route of you know pursuing um, involving law enforcement. Some survivors would not want that, you know, and that's absolutely fine too. If someone doesn't want to um, involve the police and doesn't want to, you know, go down that route of, you know, um, the criminal the criminal justice system route, that, then that's absolutely fine too. We have other ways in which we can support survivors. And that's where um, the question of the GD GDPR comes in, um, G um, you know, um, so with GDPR has made our life a lot easier as well, um, because with GDPR, the right to be forgotten um, is quite useful for us, because sometimes if there is any content about survivors online and it's out there on a website, or there's articles about them, for example, then we can use the right to be forgotten um, guidelines and just email them and ask them that this survivor just wants all their data to be removed off the internet because they want to, this is their decision at this point and it could potentially harm them and then, then we have had a case where we were able to remove a survivor's information from a newspaper article. Um, it wasn't in public interest. The only, the only, um, the only response, the, the only way in which they would not remove the information is if it's in public interest. So if there is a perpetrator and their inf information is online, then they would not remove it because they would say it's in public interest for this information to be out there. But anything about a survivor that is online and then they don't want it out there then we can use right to be forgotten and have that information removed. And we've used it quite a lot. And Google also has a right to be forgotten form. So any information that is any photos about a survivor online, then we can we can use that form and, and have that information taken off. So uh, before I end, I just want to share some top tips, which is relevant to survivors, but it's relevant to anyone really, uh, anyone that uses uses technology, anyone that is online, anyone that uses social media account. The first thing that I mentioned earlier is, well, Google yourself often, <laughs> Google your name, see what's out there about you online. And if there is anything that you didn't know existed and how it could be used against you at any point. And obviously you can use right to be forgotten. Um, you can fill in the Google right to be forgotten form and have the information removed if it's, if it's not in your interest and if you don't want it out there anymore. Do not use family sharing or linked devices or accounts. Um, this is very relevant to people who might feel that they, they could be getting control because family sharing features could be very much exploited. We see quite a lot where a survivor is fled and their children accounts are linked via family sharing. And then the perpetrator has access to quite a lot. Set two-factor authentication with alerts set to your mobile and can't emphasize how important that is. I know a lot of you might have, might be already using two-factor verification on your on your accounts. Uh, so 
changing passwords regularly and having two-factor authentication is just maintaining good digital hygiene. It's very, very important. Download an antivirus to your devices. But keep in mind that not all antiviruses are able to detect spyware. So if, if there is a spyware, then an antivirus doesn't guarantee that it would detect it and remove it. But having an antivirus software on, your, on, on all your devices is good practice. You can have it on your phone, you can have it on your laptops, you can have it you know, on your tablets. And there are some free versions in the market as well that you can download to run quick scans. Check the settings within your home devices. So check settings within uh, smart home technology. So for example, Alexa's, Nest, uh, smart uh, a ring doorbell. If you're using any of those, check the settings, see who has got access to them, see what you're sharing. If someone else is using the same account as you, regularly update your device. Updating software is very, very key because every time you update your software, they release new security features and change your Wi-Fi password regularly. I can't emphasize on this enough because Wi-Fi, your Wi-Fi network could actually be hacked into. If you haven't changed your Wi-Fi code, so when, when you first get your router and they come with the code, the generic code, those codes actually get rotated occasionally. So a lot of network providers, they use similar digits, but they rotate them. So for someone who's tech savvy, it's not very hard for them to guess what your Wi-Fi code is. And once, and to, once they're into your Wi-Fi network, through the Wi-Fi network, they can hack into your devices. So change your Wi-Fi code often, uh, or at least once. Uh, and also your admin settings, so your Wi-Fi hub settings, changing password to those as well is, is incredibly crucial. For more information, you can find loads of resources on our website. We've got um, resources on tech abuse and tech safety resources. We've got guides and tips for survivors and also professionals. So feel free to have a look at that. And last but not the least, we have a chat bot on our website, which has been translated into uh, these three languages, Urdu, Polish and Spanish. Uh, it's got step by step tutorials, which could be very helpful for survivors, but also just anyone. It just tells you how to change your settings, your password setting, two-factor authentication, um, or it, it's very easy step-by-step -step guides that anyone could follow. Um, so yeah, check it out when you have a minute. And that's it for me. Thank you for joining. Um, we have some minute to take, a few minutes to take questions now, isn't it? We have about five minutes. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you so much, Ilaha. Um, we also, I just posted the link tree link and I included the the um, the campaign, the naked threat campaign link and um, refuge. So if you click that link tree, it'll take you there and also to 16 days things as well. Thank you so much, Ilaha. That's so interesting. Um, Thank you. Great. And um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I can pop my um, I can pop down my email. So feel free to ask me. It was very brief. Um, I when we arranged this talk, I was talking to Joe about how long this should be because we deliver. We can talk all day about this topic, and you know, it's it's a broad one, and there's still unfortunately a gap in the law and in the knowledge when it comes to this specific form of abuse. Um, so if anyone has any questions or wants to know more, wants to get involved in our campaigns and our work, feel free to drop me an email. Okay, thank you. There it is, that's the email. Um, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, definitely reach out to Alaha if you have more questions. Uh, me and Joe will be, uh, also you can reach out to us for the Against Sexual Violence Project. We'll be doing more events like this. And hopefully um, if there's interest for people to, to have a more deep dive into this, um, Refuge has been such a great partner for us um, as well. So we can look forward to more, to more events like this as well. Um, but yeah, thank you. Lots of gratitude in the, in the chat as well. So thank you so much. I really have to dash out now because I have another meeting, but it was lovely meeting you all. Um, thank you for joining and uh, have a very lovely day. Thanks, yes, you Laura. too. Goodbye, Bye. everyone. Bye.
Hi, Lou. Yeah, I would like to get involved. Yeah, yeah, it's great to have you. Yeah, I'm sorry I was so late. So I just had something happen at home today. But uh, I would like to get involved more. And I did book to listen to a talk yesterday, but it was on at the same time as a lecture. So mm. is there a way I can get to these um, series of seminars after the event? Yes. Yeah, so we are actually, let me just stop uh, recording this one.